And we'll just uh, jump right in. I think that I'll ask the first question here, which is that if I'm not mistaken, you were the last candidate, at least the last candidate with significant civic experience to enter the race. So, um, and, and that was after other significant candidates had already declared. I'm curious as to when you made the decision to run and what inspired it when you did make that decision. So I've kind of been making that decision for a long time and I keep putting it off and saying next time. And, and part of that is, you know, um, a lot of people have asked me over the years to run and I just wanted to be sure I was comfortable enough and had enough background and, um, and work in the city, put in the work before I did do it. And um, not a sad story really, but um, my dad died in June and I found myself sort of thinking about things a little. My dad was very proud of my civic engagement. My parents were both always very civically engaged. And um, my dad was a bit of, of a polarizing figure in his hometown, but they did a lot for the city. And I think it was partly that. He actually died before he knew, but he would have been really excited. And um, that probably had something to do with it, not directly, but I've been thinking about it for a long time. People have been urging me and asking me to do it. And so it was, I pulled papers very late. They were due on Wednesday and I pulled them Monday afternoon. So that right. was a dash. And, but I had been thinking about it for years. So in that sense, it wasn't a flippant last minute decision. Well, was your father in, living in this area or somewhere else? No, my parents, um, I'm from the Midwest and my parents were living in Northfield, Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Interesting town. It has two colleges, St. Olaf and Carleton. Otherwise, it'd be kind of a little farmer town. And um, but they had gone. My father had become very ill. Long story. Uh, and they had gone to live with my sister last December in Florida. So the last couple of times I saw my parents, my dad was in Florida. My mom is still there at my sister's house. I obviously don't want to dwell on this, but I am curious. You said your father was a polarizing figure in his community. Can you just give us a little hint and as insight into what that was about? Well, actually, when they first moved there, and they moved to Minneapolis, and then they moved to Northfield, a small town. And when they first moved there, and um, my dad started getting involved, people would always write art articles about him, quoting him in the newspaper and stuff. And mentioned that he was Italian, like everybody there, there's so many Scandinavians and it was kind of funny, but my mom also worked very hard to get uh, a, a youth center run by youth open and a, a skateboard park. And my dad was on the planning commission there and there were just, there was team Suma and there was team not Suma. I don't know, if that's how I would describe it, but they actually did a lot for the community. Um. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna move on, but I, I do want to ask one final question on on your candidacy itself. Okay. Did your final decision to run was it affected by the people that were already in the race, or was it independent of of that? No, it was really independent, and I think there was some confusion about that. Um, and I actually checked with my colleague Ed to make sure that he would not, in some way, that that would not be unwelcome to him. And if he had told me, "Yeah, don't do it now, Doria," I would have waited but he didn't tell me that. And that was the one person I really felt I had to sort of check with because, okay. it, yeah. Um, and then another sort of introductory question here. Um, you, you've painted a picture of your interest in just furthering your civic involvement and contributing to the community as, as the reasons for running. Can you summarize what the the policy issues are that are driving your your desire to serve on the council and to the extent to which they are reflecting a desire to change the direction of the current council in some way or their approach uh, on a on a on a broad scale we'll get into the issues but i wonder if you could answer that so i think the pol oh, it, so we're going to be dealing with a lot of change in palo alto everyone's going to be dealing with a lot of change because of this huge thing called global warming that we all have to react to locally as well as globally. And it's pretty daunting, but also we have all these state mandates and a need to densify that um, we're, it's gonna happen. And I would like to, I have a lot of interest in land use and how people uh, 
perceive their life in the city and enjoy it. And I think I can help make those decisions. I think there's going to be some hard decisions coming up and I fully see that we'll be densifying. And I'm not a put a cloche over Palo Alto and let's have everything stay the same as it always was. Palo Alto has changed a lot since I moved here in, I, I'm not good with dates, let's say 85, um, <laughs> 86. It's changed a lot, but I have seen it sort of zeitgeist be kind of the same, you know? So I don't, I don't, every loss of an individual thing is not a loss to me. It's just a transition, it's growth. And what's the hardest decision that you think Palo Alto is going to face in the term that you'd serve on the council in the next eight years? I think, um, well, eight years. That's I'm giving you the benefit of re-election okay. already. Um, I think housing and um, sea level rise, I think, is going to be big, although maybe that has a longer horizon. Um, grade separations is a huge thing, whether or not we're going to have to accommodate High speed rail at some point with crossy, uh, crossing tracks. And I think those will be big issues. I think how we adjust to our traditional revenue collection, um, being primarily from sales tax and uh, transient occupancy tax. Um, I don't know how much we can predict uh, on the TOT tax, especially coming back as strong. So I think we'll have to think about revenue. I think we're on a pretty tight purse string right now. And that may mean not being able to do some of the projects we want to do and, and choose the ones that we really need to do instead. Okay, Justin. Great. Um, so Doria, I'd like to start with one of the most difficult decisions that you've weighed in on um, during your tenure on the planning commission, which is of course, Castilea. Um, so many meetings, so many reviews, so many recommendations, re recommendations reversed. Neighborhood, neighbors feeling they haven't been heard, school feeling like it's been dragged through an unfair process. Can you talk to us about how you got to your final vote and how that thinking kind of reflects what your priorities um, would be uh, or your process would be if you were on the council? Yes. So Caslet, the one thing I was hoping you wouldn't ask because it was such a divisive project, you know? And everybody, I think most people wanted to see the school upgraded. The classrooms, especially downstairs, were pretty awful actually, but it was just how it was done. I really, from the very beginning, um, I wanted the um, consideration of underground parking garages for conditional uses in R1. I wanted that to be a separate policy issue that was discussed outside of the CASTI project itself. And I think given the many years, we had time to do that and we just didn't do that. So that was a disappointment to me because I do not think it's unreasonable in every situation to have underground um, parking for conditional uses in residential neighborhoods. In some places it's really desirable and some places residents might want it the question there was more, should it, call, uh, should it count as um, FAR? And there was a lot of misunderstanding around that. There was a lot of um, framing the issue in terms of girls' education and people who wanted a slightly different outcome or a different process to get to the outcome or against girls' education that I think was unnecessarily divisive in this community. Um, Casalea was asking for a lot and I, I am particularly, and that's probably just part of my upbringing um, and my response to the world is that I, I get very uncomfortable with certain individuals getting privileges that others don't get. That's very important to me. And I do, I, Castle was asking for FAR and um, extra square footage to be kind of, a variance, which wasn't a very good process to do it without getting into too many specifics, unless you want to talk about Castilea for a half an hour. They were asking for a lot, and I don't think that everybody who lives in an R1 zone is going to be given that same thing. And in fact, a lot of those were granted through an ordinance that was really designed only for Castilea, which we like to call spot zoning, which is not my favorite thing to do. But I'm glad it finally is resolved and everybody's gonna move on. And let's let's hope for a really peaceful 
construction period, haha, because it's going to be hard construction period. And, you know, let's hope it really works out. Let's hope their TDM works out. Let's hope it's successful for everybody. Because or is that, are, do you have a follow up or are you going to change the subject, Jocelyn? No, I was going to follow up. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so in the end, you felt like the ask was just too high. Um, can I extrapolate then from, from what you said that um, you're looking for in future projects with developers who are asking too much, you would cast kind of a skeptical eye on that kind of um, proposal? Then is that I, something that you could see carrying over to a council? Um, I, yes, I do. And I also am uncomfortable when we approve a policy issue as part of a quasi-judicial application. And that happened several years ago on the, uh, the so-called work for the uh, VTA lot project, which is Alta Locale, the workforce housing. And that was really tricky because um, um, I had to recuse myself from the quasi-judicial project because of a letter written by PAN, Palo Alto Neighborhoods, several years earlier. But since the policy was a citywide policy, I could I could participate in that. And after uh, advising me to do it that way, the our attorney's office said that was really messy and we shouldn't do that again. And we keep doing that again. And I think that's problematic. I would, I would prefer to look at citywide policy issues outside of the lens of a specific application. I think it's a better way to do it for the city. Doria, the, the um just about everybody that touched the Castellana proposal came under a lot of criticism. The staff um, uh, didn't do great staff work on it. The Planning Commission um, spent a long time on it. The council sent it back. It wasn't exactly the way we hope and strive to efficiently govern in Palo Alto, even though we often get ourselves into these kinds of quagmires. Mm -hmm. um, what would you have changed if you were on the council um, sitting in their shoes to have made this a different process than it was? I think I would have given early direction to separate the issues. I think we should have had a discussion about parking conditional uses citywide outside of Castellas project early on. And I think that we, you know, it wasn't till the council sent it back to the planning commission the last time that that it was at that time, and I don't remember the date exactly, that they also asked for, hey, the square footage kept changing. We didn't even know the square footage. We needed better data on the project from the beginning, which is remarkable since the EIR process is takes so long. It's expensive for the applicant. It's hard. It takes so long. You need special SQL lawyers to really understand it. Um, we, we never had the square footage correct. So I think getting... And another problem is, so I think getting the data early on, the planning commission also at the first scoping session asked for a no garage uh, option to be considered in the EIR. And that was always a disappointment to some of us on the planning commission. Um, and I think these big projects that are asking for a lot of exceptions, we, we do such, um, I think the council and the staff and the boards and commissions do a really, really honestly hard job to look at everything really thoroughly. And it makes it take longer. And then the project, the applicant has spent so much time and money trying to push these things through. And then I think we start feeling bad if we're not going to approve it. And I think that's, it's the primrose path theory for me. And I think that's kind of messy also. So I think if we had had more data early on, if we had correct data early on, if we had looked at a no garage option uh, to fully understand the range of options that people were thinking about um, neighbors and the applicant, and if we had had better uh, specific data early on, it could have maybe happened a little quicker. That being said, Castellea changed a lot. The applicant changed a lot during the process. So new things were introduced, but it was, I think painful for everyone, and we should avoid that if possible in the future. Well, I heard that there were there was one or more mediation sessions that were attempted. Um, do you feel that that is the kind of technique or process that could be used more productively in the future? It didn't seem like it really helped this time. 
Did you uh, did you say mediation? Mediation. Yeah, mediation. Um, between the neighbors and the. And yeah. P you know, P N Q L. You know, I don't know what happened because I wasn't in the room, but I know that P N Q L didn't feel they were um, given a serious shot at things, and it was very frustrating for them. That said, the applicant always act, gets extra time than than the public in speaking and whatnot. But I do not feel that they thought it was successful. But that said, I wasn't in the room and can't speak for them. Okay. It was a grueling, grueling one. But um, like I said, hopefully it results in a better school for the girls and is a successful project. That's all we, that's what we can hope for now. And I really, the other thing I hope, and I think they've actually realized this now is they never wanted to say they were gonna uh, locate the girls off school during construction. And I thought that was, it was not in the purview of PTC really, but I just thought that was unbelievable. But I don't, I think now they have realized they're gonna have to do that. So I'm happy because. Do you think the city manager and the planning director have learned something from this experience that would would change things in the future? And if so, what what have they learned? Yes, I do think so. And I think part of this is on our former city manager because the violations in enrollment were not taken seriously. And that created um, a lot of ill will. And that also contributed, and I do believe that was under mostly under the um, former city manager, Jim Keene. I think that also set up a sort of um, a sense of unfairness because they weren't charged the full amount they should have been charged. And in fact, they were technically in violation during the application process also. So I have a great interest in code enforcement in the city also, which is kind of a, always been a little bit understaffed to say the least. And um, I think that that sense of fairness comes in there. I think that would have been the main thing. I don't know what was negotiated behind closed doors, but there was always a sense that there was an open door for Castilea with staff and there was not for the neighborhood. But like I said, the applicant is paying for the process. So that's always a little bit the case. I'm switching off of Castilea, but still kind of on this theme of accountability. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering, it seems like decisions made by the council sometimes don't have the follow-up that's needed to find out what the actual you know, consequences were of decisions. And I'm thinking, uh, you mentioned Alta Locale, I'm thinking of this idea of car light development. Um, so the question is like, is there a process that you would support that would return to decisions for a post-decision-making analysis to see actually if some of the policies that are being implemented are you know, are living up to the, the expectations. Um, yeah. how, how can the city become better at that and communicating with the public? We made this decision, we bet on this policy, here's what happened. Alta Locale is particularly a failure to me because, and, and that sounds harsh, but because I know people are living there and enjoying their lives there. It's almost fully rented, but it's a failure in the sense that it was sort of presented as afford, having an affordability factor and it has none. And it's really, really expensive per square foot. When you mentioned car light parking, I think one of the things that we don't ever follow up on and have no follow up data on for as long as we've been using them are TDMs. And I've been bringing this up with um, various planning directors over the years. It would be really good to know how those are working. And I always like to say my favorite TDM is the one for Edgewood Plaza, which is an eight and a half by 11 framed under glass plaque on the wall of the outside of the of one of the buildings that tells them which bus routes go there. And it's probably out of date now since we're our own shuttle isn't going there anymore. So I think we need a lot more understanding on how those TDMs are working. Um, does that answer your question? Um, in, in some ways, I think the broader question is just how, how does the council prioritize following up on decisions made in the past with the kind of direction to, to staff to, you know, do the analysis and bring it back to the council so that people don't, you know, forever point their finger saying like, oh, well, they were trying to do that based on this, this, you know, philosophy. And we don't even know if it's, it's actually uh, it's, it's, producing the results. 
Yeah, and I think the workforce housing overlay, I have heard several of council members opine that it was sort of a dud and isn't gonna produce much. Um, I was particularly under, uncomfortable with that because it, you, it up zones um, public facility zones, which is where we have parks or we could have county medical services or things like that. And I think those um, PF zones are very precious in our community. And I, I don't think they're always the right place to put market uh, rate housing. So, I, I, and you know, you, you look at the controversy over the planned community zone in the, in the past, and that was one where the public just didn't feel like there was any follow through on the public benefits. So that was a good example of that. But, you know, the more, the longer I work on things with the city, the more I realize the volume of work and the detail that decision makers want um, on, to get stuff done is really a daunting task, you know? Um, but I still think there are areas where we, we can't just rely on things working. And I think um, TDMs and the workforce housing overlay are good examples. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. I, I was struck by a sentence in your survey to us about your vision for the future of Palo Alto, where you said it's going to be a future of greater economic and ethnic diversity. And I am curious as to what your plan is to achieve either one of those. Well, our ethnic diversity grows, um, it grows every decade. I mean, Palo Alto is less white than it used to be. The problem is we don't have um, um, wealth um, diversity in this community. And that's why I would like, I mean, it may be a little pie in the sky, but I have a strong um, uh, value in doing as much as we can to get affordable choices in the community. And I was trying to look at a glass half half full, not half empty in that visioning exercise. I mean, I, I think the world's on, you know, in peril. We're losing species and it's up, upsetting to me, but, you know, we have our lives to live and we have to help make them, uh, conditions better for other people. That's the way I look at it. But um, so I do think we are growing, I mean, we're not equally diverse across every uh, ethnic background, and but we are diverser than we more diverse than we used to be. Problem is, there's no; it's too expensive. We don't have that wealth diversity, and the people that. And that being said, I also worry about there's especially older people. There's a lot of older people in this community that are uh, don't want to move. They can't afford to move someplace they want to. They don't want to move, leave their community, but they don't have a lot of income. They have a little plot of land with a little old house on it. So I kind of worry about them being a little left behind, which is a little outside of your question, I think. Well, and I, and I was focusing primarily on the economic diversity, which gets us into housing. And I, I wonder if you could... Um, as best you can summarize what your views on what further steps the city should be taking to create um, not just more housing or denser housing, but affordable housing. Well, I would be in favor of expanding, which I believe the council already directed staff to do recently, expanding the inclusionary percentage to rental housing. Um, it, it was illegal for a long time to do in California and about three years ago, I'm sure you guys all know this, but the Palmer mm -hmm. fix, as it called, happened. And, and I don't know why we didn't do that right away. And it seems like we could expand it to 20% from 15% inclusionary. Um, I think that's one thing. I think the other thing is to um, uh, work with, afford, you know, affordable housing gets built by affordable housing providers. And it's very competitive and difficult. It's mostly funded by tax, federal tax credits. So anything we can do to um, bolster our housing fund, which is I think almost at zero now, if not zero. And we do have very high impact fees on commercial development um, for that housing fund. So I think those are the kind of things we have to do. That being said, it's it's pretty aspirational to want to get a lot of affordable housing. And I have another question that I ask staff, and that is um, about Section 8 housing, because you don't have to build special places for Section 8 housing. It could be any rental housing. 
And I don't know much about it. And I'm sure the federal government keeps pretty good statistics on it. Um, and I have a neighbor who lives in um, the lower Mayfield development, Mayfield place, um, who often speaks about section eight. And I am I am wondering if there's a way we can encourage more of that, maybe for ADUs when they're being used as rental. Um, I just don't know what the numbers are. I don't hear people talking about it very much. So uh, beyond the requirements that the cities has, are being imposed on it by the state, um, what, what steps would you prioritize for creating more housing, for meeting those requirements? I would also, um, well, so we have the housing element sites and the housing element group did for Palo Alto remarkably quick work, I think, on um, finding those 6,000 plus sites. And we do have more than that because we have a little cushion also that we've identified. Um, so I think that's good. I, I think people, I think there's a little misunderstanding that cities don't build housing, developers do, and that city, cities are getting criticized for not building enough housing. I mean, we have to make, we have to make our zoning uh, appealing enough to developers without um, absolutely catering to uh, providing the maximum profit for them so that we can still have some um, sense of balance between abutting and uh, nearby projects and their impacts. Um, let's see. And I, I have very strongly said, I don't think we need to build any commercial um, right now until we know, I mean, we, we have the largest jobs housing imbalance. We have a bigger jobs housing imbalance in Manhattan, you know? We built way too much commercial, um, especially uh, high paid tech jobs without protecting in some cases, uh, in, incursion into uh, actual sites that provided um, sort of uh, more neighbor serving small business like accountants and therapists and rolfers and people like that. A lot of them have gone, especially because I live so close to Cal Ave. I mean, we really were dealing with this Post COVID, it's hard to say what is exactly going on, but I would say let's not build any more new commercial um, and let's zone for more housing. You know, to me, it's a big disappointment that after all the years that the Fry site was zoned RM30, um, what comes down the pike is a loss of tens of thousands of retail, not that it was all going to be that viable there and a lot more office. So we've got actually more office there. We have more housing because we have the 85, I think it is condos. But I, and you know, there's some good things about that. Um, but I, I would have, I, I think it was 27 years ago that that was rezoned housing. And that's because the people of North Ventura thought it was, it was moving too far in the direction not being housing and kind of wrecking the North Ventura, the North part of the Ventura neighborhood. And then it just sort of languished and nobody really, uh, it was extended multiple times by various councils, which was a little disappointment to me. But, um, uh, you know, we will be getting housing there. I just don't think we need commercial. I think there's, anecdotally, I think there's a lot of vacancy in commercial, and part of that is work from home, which is really great for the environment. But I think we should be thinking about filling any vacancies we have in commercial before we build new commercial. I think that would better serve those, um, I think it better serves everyone, and also the people that own those parcels. But I think we need to get some data on that, and we, we're not very good with our business registry. so. I don't, but I would, I would like to know that before we build any more commercial. I don't, I, I, I don't, uh, I was, I was a part of the referendum that worked on the citywide cap. I, I almost thought it was too much still. I would like to see more housing in, in the Stanford Research Park and other appropriate areas of Stanford. I, you know, I don't think Stanford takes their responsibility um, in this regard strongly enough and now they're asking for their houses that um, 
they're asking for a tax break also, which takes money from the schools, the schools their kids go to. So I think Stanford could also be a big part of um, improving the housing situation. And so it, I mean, what we hear from the development community, obviously, is that if you don't give us a way to um, make a greater profit um, or, or, or have this economically be feasible, the housing's not going to be built. And there's two basic approaches to dealing with that. One is um, to have por a part of the, the development be commercial, which helps to pay for and bring down the cost to the rest of it or increase the density and go up in height. Um, I don't hear you advocating for either one of those. Well, Is that right? It's, I think there's better solutions. Yeah, I would say that's right. And one of the reasons is we don't get any financial analysis from developers who don't want to share it of those statements. We have no way of knowing if they're right or not right. And I think that residential has become so expensive Per square foot, it's almost equal. The other thing is we have examples of all residential buildings that are within our height uh, limit that uh, have were profitable. Um, Alto Locale is un, in under 50 feet. It's right at 50 feet. Um, it's residential. It has a tiny, tiny little, I don't even know if it's there. I've never gone in the building. It's supposed to have a little bike repair shop that the public could use also, but it's tiny, tiny, tiny. It's not really- But as you point out, it's unaffordable. It's it's very expensive. I know, that's the problem. And I think that there are places that we're gonna put um, multifamily that could be higher, but you know, to me, you can't abut a 70 foot building next to a low density residential neighborhood. You. I have uh, 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 the notion that even for an RM40 building, you build another really tall building next to it that shades its light and their circulation. It's unfair to the people living there. I think regardless of where people live, at what zone, they have certain expectations for that basic kind of thing. Daylight plane alone does not do it the way the transition, the 150 foot transition zone. And I think we can find enough places across the city to add housing to achieve that. Um, the Cato project, I don't know if you remember it, that was in, proposed for my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. That was like, it, it was an insignificant number over the R1. That's R1, mm -hmm. I know within R1. It, it was like two or and a half or three or four feet over the height limit, which was not a problem. But you right size that for some of the, and it was three stories. You right size that for some of the uh, shallow uh, lots on El Camino, south of Page Mill, that are sort of hard to develop and, and respect that transition to low density residential that happens mid block behind it. You right size that for those larger lots, and it's perfect for there. And they were going to make money on that project. That's why they wanted to do it. It's, you know, it was a developer. It was a little bit of a stunt, I thought, as well. And um, so I, I think there's better ways to do things. Does it mean everything is, so there's gonna be lots of compromises. I think height is something we can compromise on. You know, on a 50 foot building, you're not gonna notice at your street level experience is not gonna, I maintain, not gonna notice five feet. It's insignificant. It's when we get a lot higher and some of the solutions, um, some of the solutions along El Camino that we talked about in the housing element um, had podium parking, two levels above, you know, at grade and above grade, two levels, and then four stories of housing. And to me, and that was to make it more affordable for developers, but they're currently making money off of buildings that have underground garage requirements. So I don't, I haven't, nobody's proven to me that they won't still make money. Would they make more if they were allowed to build more cheaply? Sure. Well, it's, it sounds like one of the points you're making here is that the council is ill-equipped to really evaluate the proposals that come before it. And I don't see the solution you're proposing to that. You, you, you have a gut instinct that they're making, that they're making money. Um, but where's the data? I mean, the, the, the developers are not going to share with you their proprietary data. I don't the city know is I'm... not, the city is not uh, retaining expert real estate consultants to really help them through this. 
So how do we know what the economics are of the various development alternatives? Well, that's my point, I think, exactly. We don't know what the economics are because we haven't been given that information. And I know that that in the last, I know that it has always been profitable to develop in Palo Alto. That's why we have a lot of development. So I'm not sure what's going on. Plus all the rents go up too. So there's more, there's a proportional revenue. I just don't feel we've been given um, the best reasons to do things that have uh, negative impacts potentially. And you can build a building. It's, you know, where, where zones abut is the most sensitive area. And that's where the 150 foot height transition limit that keeps things low and then says you can go higher once you get out of that zone is very useful for densification. And one place we don't have that problem as much is some of the places that we're looking at down on San Antonio near 101 because there are no existing lower density uh, uses to loom over. So that might be a better place, but I worry as do a lot of my colleagues on the planning commission that there also aren't parks and um, good opportunities for safe bikeways there, uh, safe route to schools. There aren't the amenities there. So we should take that into consideration as we plan there. It was Karen Holman who said very many years ago, we don't wanna warehouse people, we wanna house people. And I think that's still a nice little phrase. So when you look at our neighboring communities in Mountain View and Redwood City in particular, do you see anything you like about the new development that those two cities have pursued? Um, I would have to go and look at those cities more carefully with that in mind, because honestly, we've, I've been at home for a lot still. You know, I haven't, I would, I would have to go survey the cities and, and look at that. I can't make a snap judgment off the top of my head. But, um, I, I, and also I, I wonder if, um, what the occupancy rate is in some of these cities. Menlo Park has just built a tremendous amount of new mixed use along El Camino also. Mm -hmm. And okay. I think some of that looks pretty welcome. It really is challenging though, because a lot of our, um, a lot of the lots on El Camino South Page Mill are relatively shallow and it's hard to achieve. Um, it's hard to respect the 150 foot height limit. It, it, it's really the whole lot. And then you get into these, um, these um, decisions where you have to maybe hurt one party or another, the existing residents or the applicants. And there's also traffic, you know, no matter what you build, whether it's commercial or um, housing, it's gonna have traffic implications. Um, all right, well, uh, at the beginning of our conversation, you cited uh, climate change as something that you're considerably uh, concerned about. And I'm wondering from the SCAP um, plan, what if you got onto the council, what would be like the most urgent steps um, that you think that the council really needs to act upon? in order to get um, us to our goal as a city? We, um, um, our grid, which just recently the Utilities Advisory Commission and the utility professionals said it just can't take everybody going all electric. So I think we have to put some money into upgrading our grid. That would be the first thing. And then the other thing is to protect our open spaces. I have my vision of environmentalism is not just greenhouse gases, that's one thing, but also biodiversity and retaining habitat for native species is very important to me. So in as much as I do not see those places developing and, and then sea level rise is gonna be a problem, problematic because we have so much of our, we have a lot of building in the flood zone. So that's gonna be another issue that I think will be of more immediate need. And the city is already taking some steps to do that, but it's, you know, all of these things are unclear how quickly they're gonna happen. But those are the things that I think we can make the most difference on immediately. Yeah, so to unpack those, um, the first one about funding the uh, grid improvement, 
do you have any thoughts on where that funding would come from? It seems like it'd be a sizable amount. Yeah, no, I think we're gonna have to get shovel ready projects in place. And so we are, can nimbly grab um, grants as they become available. I think we'll have to do that for grade steps too. And um, we tend to take a lot of time, I think in um, preparing projects to be ready to go out for those grants. And, um, but I think that's what we're gonna have to do. I mean, if the utilities department and the UAC both go to the council and say, we're not gonna be able to fully electrify the city without doing that, then we're gonna have to find the money to do it. And I am worried about the funds and that's why I was very skeptical of this greatly diminished business tax. And um, I've learned a lot more about the gas transfer tax, which is something we've done for 70 years, I guess in Palo Alto, because I didn't, the discussion, the staff report for council recently when they discussed that and the discussion was very confusing to me. So I interviewed a bunch of people basically to get some more information. And I think, I think I'm in favor of both of those now. We need both of those just to keep our heads, you know, level. And then we're going to have to figure out more funding. But I don't see a lot of other funding sources outside of um, tax increases and bond measures, you know. And I don't know if the TOT is going to come back. I was told not to use acronyms, but I feel like I can use them with you guys. <laughs> You don't think that that hospital, uh, sorry, hotel revenues are going to come back? I don't know. Travel is going to bounce back. Um, I, I don't know if they'll really, I, I, I think that was, um, I think it was clear we didn't have, that we were relying an awful lot on that. And, you know, it changed like overnight. So I don't know. Those are the ideas I have. And I don't think those are very innovative ideas, but I think that's what governments do. Mm hmm and about the flooding, um, are you supportive then of um, the JPA plans for San Francisco Creek as, as they are right now? Yes, yes. And the horizontal levy, I watched a little informational meeting about the horizontal levy and found out a lot about what a horizontal levy was. So yeah, I'm in favor of those. And um, I also think it's important when people redevelop in you know, there are FEMA laws about redevelopment in flood zones, and I'm, I hope the city follows those, because if you have a project, a residential project, and it's going to be over 50, the cost of that project is going to be over 50%, unless this has changed recently, of the assessed value, you have to bring everything up to the, and I don't know if the city always requires that. I did a little investigation once several years ago with a, um, a friend of mine who uh, I've worked on city projects with, mostly before I was on the planning commission, Jeff Levinsky. And um, we it was pretty clear the city wasn't doing that. So I think it's important to follow those rules, um, even though it may be more expensive for homeowners, but it brings them up to the federally required standards another important thing i think okay we're, we're running short on times here i want i would like to ask you some quick questions and just see if okay. i can get sort of a, your your quick response the first okay. is um on grade separations you've you've um outlined in your survey results and in forums your your basic viewpoint here um which is as i interpret it is essentially supporting being supportive of the recommendations that came out of the of the citizens group, um, what, where do you feel you can contribute to bringing this to a close, make getting the decisions made so that we can actually get started on whatever direction we're gonna be going in? Um, well, I, I think we're ready to make some of those decisions. And I think we should start with um, the south crossings, I think we should start with building the bike and ped crossings. We've needed those anyway for a long time. And they'll only um, during the um, action. And then I think we should work on getting a shovel ready, as they say, plan for South Palo Alto's crossings. 
as soon as we can, because the general consensus, and I wasn't super involved in the rail meetings. I did not volunteer to do that because I felt there were other people that were going to be better at that than me. And I try not to say yes to everything people ask me to volunteer doing. Um, and we had really good rail people already in the city. Um, and so I think if we concentrated on those head bike crossings and um, the South Charleston East Meadow crossings and got something ready there first, I think that the downtown Palo Alto Ave and the transit center should be addressed in a broader, somewhat delayed uh, area plan for downtown holistically so it can all be planned at once. And then I think Churchill, the council has already really preferred that plan for there. So I think that's what we should do. And I think we should try to move on it pretty quickly. Okay, thank you. And the, the second question is housing at Coverly? Uh, not for me at this time. I think Coverly, there's the, the, the school isn't gonna give us any land unless we swap some There's a, for a park um, near a school. And I'm not sure how those neighbors feel about that kind of swap. A, and I just don't, I think what we need to do, what we need to concentrate on now and what we have the funds for now is maintaining what we have there because it's a, even though it's a little rundown and shabby, it's like, you know, it's like my 1989 325i BMW. It's beloved, even though it's a little shabby. So I think we have to keep that community center available for all the nonprofits, the individual art studios, for everything that goes on there. So. I don't set my sights as high as the last um, the last project that the, I think the consultant's name was Concordia maybe, um, that they envisioned there, which I think is outside of our reach at this time in terms of funding. So I know this could get us into a whole nother sidebar great, here, but, but, you, but you raised the, the question of, the neighbors and concerns that the neighbors might have in respect to Coverly, and I've heard you mention it at other at other situations. Can you give me an example of where you've where you've made a decision or would make a decision where it wouldn't be well received by the immediate neighbors, but it's the best thing for the city as a whole? Um, I I actually think the recent housing project on West Bay Shore fell into that category for me. Um, it was poorly received aesthetically and design-wise by the ARB. And it's the parking down there, it's like the end of Colorado and such is very, very difficult at night. And it's kind of a little bit of an island and they have to build it up on a berm. I forget how many feet. It's really gonna look funny until other things are built up on a berm next to it. Um, but it was 100% legal and it was providing in, in, in 100% consistent with our governing documents. That's what I mean by legal. And um, a consistent with our comp plan and our municipal code. I, I didn't like the project, but I felt like I absolutely couldn't say no to it. Oops, sorry. Last quickie here. Um, binding arbitration for police um, uh, misconduct and other matters. Uh, we currently have binding arbitration in Palo Alto and one of the commonly discussed reforms across the country is to get rid of this process because it is so difficult to actually succeed at removing a police officer. Do you have a view on that? My view is that I don't have enough experience on how we deal with the police unions and the police officers, but I know that it's a problem because it's very difficult for the police to remove. You know, you get one bad apple and the whole uh, thing looks bad and that's not the case. I've I've anecdotally, although I fall into the demographic that is probably well served by police being white and female, but I anecdotally have had really positive interactions with the Palo Alto police, so I don't think they're all bad. But I'm going to have to uh, look at that more carefully and ask my friend Winter Dellenbach about it, because I don't know as much about that as I should. I, I can tell you what Winter's going to say, but you, you go ahead and do that. <laughs> Uh, related to law enforcement, you said on your website that the 911 system must be more robust, and I'm wondering what you think is needed uh, to oh. increase its robustness. Oh, I, I don't know. 
if I should, if that was stated correctly, I do, I have a strong feeling that people in Palo Alto are very concerned about what they perceive as rising crime. And I don't think, I just talked to our new police chief a couple of weeks ago, statistically there's not rising crime, but I see, I think what people see is more personal assaults, not the stolen um, property. And I think that really scares a lot of people. And I, I think it's very frightening like for some members of our community, that's like the number one issue, which surprises me. And I'm a person that lives a block from El, El Camino. So it surprised me, but I think if that perception is there, then the concern is real. And I do think that like the recent, um, some of the recent incidents at Stanford Shopping Center with armed robbers, multiple men, people with guns in the middle of the day, People see that and they're, they're afraid. And I, I think that's terrible. I think we should do better. I wish we could get back to, and it wasn't just COVID where we cut um, police officers. It's been kind of a steady um, problem with police and, and, and fire um, over the last 15 or so years. And I know there's a lot of union issues involved there and I'm not, I don't have familiarity with union issues other than what I read in the paper and I hear from my friends Winter and Fred Ballin was very involved with um, fire issues. And, um, but I, I think we need to address those things. Can I follow up with something? Um, yeah, no, <laughs> thanks, Daria. I, I asked during the forum last week whether, um, what Palo Alto should do better in terms of fair and unbiased policing. And I think most candidates talked about broader crime trends and staffing, but didn't really address that specifically. I just wanna ask again, uh, do you think, uh, the Palo Alto Police Department has room for improvement when it comes to fair and unbiased policing, because the issue did came up a lot in 2020, but we haven't heard as much from the council since. Yeah, I mean, we have had incidents of police abuse in Palo Alto. It's not as extreme as in some other parts of the country, but it's totally unacceptable. Um, and I think the police have tried to address that. And I think this new chief, I, I have high hopes from him. I, I think um, restoring unencrypted radio has part, something to do with that. But it, it, we should have zero tolerance for any kind of bias treatment and um, unwarranted treatment of you know, assaults, uh, physical assaults on people. I don't know about police dogs. Um, we have one member of the community that's really interested in that right now. I'm terrified of police dogs, but um, I don't, I, I think I, I don't, so I don't have an opinion about all of those things and I'm not gonna lie and pretend I know everything I'm gonna have to learn about as a council member. I mean, I think that I will hit the ground running on certain issues, but there are a lot of things the planning commission doesn't deal with and that would be one of them policing. So, but I, I have zero, I have personal zero tolerance for any police officer that uses his position to assault a member of the public in an inappropriate way or uh, yeah, is biased or discriminated. You know, I mean, we, we don't need that in Palo Alto. There's too much of it on the planet. We don't need it here. But um, does that answer your question? Well, I was curious if there's any, uh, I appreciate hearing that it answers some partially. I'm curious whether there's any kind of policies or programs that you would uh, initiate or support when it comes to that. Uh, I don't know what to initiate because I'm not sure what's available. There was some discussion at, at a recent meeting we had with the candidates had with all the um, department heads about, I think it was called specialized jobs within the police force. But there, I was not familiar with the term and there wasn't a really, um, I would only be parroting something I didn't understand if I brought it up. There wasn't a discussion around it really, but I would be interested in learning more about that from the police force police chief, because I don't know what it means. Um, and I think the PERT program where we have mental health uh, professionals riding along with cops to deal when those situations arise is a huge improvement. And I have personal experience, heartbreaking experience with that um, a few years ago with a um, mentally ill young woman who is uh, sweet, but she could be really scary, who parked right in front of my dining room window where I'm sitting now and right across the street in the same exact location. And all of a sudden my neighbor, my next door neighbors and I were like, have you gotten any mail lately? And I'm like, you know, I haven't even gotten any junk mail lately. And the postal service, the, US, the Palo Alto post office 
wouldn't deliver mail on our one block on either side of um, Yale Street anymore because the postal uh, delivery people were afraid of this woman. And um, it, which, and they, I said, well, you know, were you gonna let us know? And they said, well, we, we sent you mail. Seriously, they did say that. <laughs> and um, and um, that had to be dealt with by a forced um, a, a 72 hour hold by the police right in front of my house. And this is a young woman who was um, obviously very, very troubled. But, and I didn't call the cops on her, but I was afraid sometimes of her too, even though she was very nice and I helped her out, I gave her clothes. And when she asked for them and money a couple of times, which they tell you you're not supposed to do, but it was very hard because she was here every day. She was a neighbor. And recently there's a guy, a homeless guy who is, um, well, because of where I live, I, I think I interact with our homeless population much more than some people in Palo Alto, just being close to El Camino because they, um, and we had a guy who'd been a resident in our neighborhood. I think it was reported, nobody really knew his name, but he was really a sweet guy. And he, he died recently, I think last winter sometime, um, right around the corner from me. I, I'm sorry, but people like that who are uh, part of the, fabric of the community, regardless of their state of housing, I think we owe it to them to take good care of them. So I think the pert, so I kind of got off track, but when this young woman was picked up against her will right in front of my house, it was really upsetting, you know, mostly for her, but for me too. So I'm glad that we have that addition. And it might even have helped that there was a situation recently where an individual who had some sort of medical emergency the police held off because they uh, the um, held off because they thought it might be a mental emergency and they thought she might be dangerous and this person didn't get to the hospital as quickly. I think the per uh, well, got people will help in that situation too. So and I'm not sure whatever other ideas will bubble up from our new police chief that will improve um, policing in Palo Alto, but I'm very open to them. Are those the longest lightning round answers you've ever received? I'm oh, sorry. No, Bill, you're muted. Oh, sorry. Jocelyn, do you have anything further? Or should yeah, we wrap I think, up here? I think we're ready to wrap. Okay. Thank you very much, Dory. I really appreciate your being here. Oh, thank good, you all. Good conversation. Thanks very much. Have a good mm -hmm. afternoon. Yeah, you too.